Hello students, this is Pathology Chapter 2, Inflammation and Repair, Lecture 2. The systemic manifestations of inflammation are fever, leukocytosis, elevated C-reactive protein, and lymphadenopathy. Fever is controlled by the regulatory center in the brain called the hypothalamus or the hypothalamic thermoregulatory center. Fever is a body temperature higher than the normal level of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees centigrade and is associated with a systemic inflammatory response. Pyrogens are fever-producing substances produced by white blood cells and pathogens. Pyrogens act on the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus increases body temperature by way of prostaglandins. The function of this increased body temperature by a fever is not clear. A moderately high fever may be helpful in combating some infections because increased temperature slows the growth of many pathogenic microorganisms. However, the body cannot tolerate excessively high fever for very long, and such fever could prove fatal. Drugs can be given to reduce high fever by reducing inflammation. Leukocytosis is an increase in the number of white blood cells circulating in the blood. The normal level is 4,000 to 10,000 per cubic millimeter. During a systemic inflammatory response, particularly a response to infection, leukocytosis occurs and the numbers increase to 10,000 to 30,000 per cubic millimeter. This increase primarily involves neutrophils. Leukocytosis is the body's attempt to provide more cells for phagocytosis. The type of white blood cells that is increasing in number can aid in differential diagnosis. A viral infection will show an increase in lymphocytes, bacterial infection, an increase in neutrophils. An allergic reaction will show an increase in eosinophils. During the inflammatory process, the lymph nodes enlarge. This enlargement is referred to as lymphadenopathy. When palpated, superficial lymph nodes may feel firmer and larger than usual and may also be tender. Deeper lymph nodes may also be enlarged, but these cannot be palpated during an examination. The enlarged nodes occur because of changes in lymphocytes, which are the primary cells of the immune response. Hyperplasia is an increase in the number of cells. Hypertrophy is an enlargement of individual cells. The lymphoid tissue in Waldeyer's ring which is the palatine, lingual, and pharyngeal tonsillar tissue, may also undergo these changes. These are images of lymphadenopathy and the lymph nodes in the head and neck. When palpating for lymphadenopathy, do not get confused with salivary glands. These are not swollen glands, they are swollen lymph tissues. C-reactive protein is produced in the liver and interacts with the complement system and the clotting mechanism. The levels of C-reactive protein can be used to help assess rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus. They are also used to monitor tissue healing. They're also used as an early detection of infection. Chronically increased levels are associated with an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and could be used as a possible marker for periodontal disease. Chronic inflammation is caused by persistent injuries. Repair cannot be completed until the source of the injury is removed. The cells involved in chronic inflammation are macrophages, 
lymphocytes, plasma cells, neutrophils, monocytes, and fibroblasts. Granulomatous inflammation is a distinctive form of chronic inflammation. It is characterized by the formation of granulomas, which are microscopic groupings of macrophages, usually surrounded by lymphocytes and occasional plasma cells. The macrophages within the granuloma become larger as they group together with their multiple nuclei and become multinucleated giant cells. Granulomatous inflammation is usually associated with foreign body reactions and some infections such as tuberculosis. Anti-inflammatory drugs block or suppress the inflammatory response, preventing or reducing the clinical signs of inflammation and the adverse reactions to the injury. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are known as NSAIDs and include aspirin and ibuprofen. Steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs include prednisone. Both NSAIDs and steroids inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandin. Antihistamines reduce the effect of histamine which is released in allergic response. Medications that are traditionally used to treat cancer, such as methotrexate, sulfasalazine, lefunamide, cyclophosphamide, and mycophenolate are now being used to treat inflammatory diseases because they suppress the inflammatory response. The cells in a tissue or organ may react to injury by undergoing an adaptive response such as hyperplasia, hypertrophy, or atrophy. Hyperplasia is an increase in the number of cells, often in response to chronic irritation or abrasion. The tissue may return to normal if the insult subsides or may persist after removal of the irritant. Hypertrophy is an increase in the size of the individual cells. This may be seen in cardiac muscle as a response to hypertension. Atrophy is a decrease in size or function of a cell, tissue, organ, or the entire body. Atrophied cells are capable of increasing to their normal size after the stress is removed. Atrophy can be present in the muscular wasting that occurs in some chronic diseases that do not allow mobility and thus function of the body. It's a type of use it or lose it type of response. This tissue slide shows the increase in epithelial thickness that accompanies hyperplasia. Regeneration is the process by which injured tissue is replaced with tissue identical to that present before the injury. Repair is the restoration of damaged or diseased tissue. There are three phases to the repair process that occur over a period of two weeks. One is inflammation, two is proliferation, and three is maturation. These figures show a small injury which involves the epithelium and connective tissue. A clot forms. The epithelial cells migrate, forming a new surface layer. Granulation tissue forms, and then that is followed by scar tissue. On the day of injury, blood flows into the injured tissue to produce a clot. The clot contains fibrin, clumped red blood cells, and platelets. The day after the injury, neutrophils migrate from the microcirculation into the injured tissue in an acute inflammatory response. Phagocytosis then occurs. Two days after the injury, monocytes change to macrophages in tissue. 
Macrophages continue phagocytosis and secrete growth factors that stimulate growth of new blood vessels in a process called angiogenesis. Neutrophils are then reduced in number. Fibroblasts increase in number and produce new collagen fibers in a process called fibroplasia. Granulation tissue, connective tissue, is formed. Epithelialization, the process by which new surface tissues is created, occurs. Blood clot acts as a scaffold for new connective tissue. Lymphocytes and plasma cells migrate to the area as chronic inflammation and the immune response begins. Seven days after the injury, inflammatory and immune responses are completed if the source of injury is removed. Fibrin is digested by tissue enzymes. It sloughs off and the initial repair is complete. The new tissue is relatively red, the new epithelium is thin, and the new connective tissue is highly vascularized. Immature collagen fibers are present and fragile. Fibroblasts differentiate into myofibroblasts. Two weeks after the injury, the initial granulation tissue and its fibers have been remodeled. Mature fibrous connective tissue is called scar tissue. It is whiter and paler because of increased collagen and decreased vascularity. Factors that affect the amount of scar tissue formed include heredity, the strength and flexibility needed in the tissue, the tissue type, and the type of repair. Tissue can repair by primary, secondary, or tertiary intention. Healing by primary intention occurs such as in a surgical incision where clean edges of the incision are joined with suture and form only a small clot. In this case, less scar tissue forms. Healing by secondary intention involves an injury in which tissue is lost, so the edges of the injury cannot be joined during healing. A large blood clot forms resulting in increased granulation tissue and may result in excess scar tissue, such as a keloid. Healing of a tooth extraction site is an example of healing by secondary intention. A keloid is excessive scarring in skin that appears raised and extends beyond its original boundaries. This image shows an example of a keloid. If infection occurs at the site of a surgical incision that is healing by primary intention, healing by tertiary intention may result. This transformation occurs because of an enlargement of the injured area and an increase in the magnitude and duration of the inflammatory and immune responses triggered by the presence of pathogenic microorganisms. In some cases, an infected injury is left open and the edges are not surgically joined until the infection is controlled. Local factors that can impair healing include bacterial infection, tissue destruction and necrosis, hematoma, excessive movement of the injured tissue, poor blood supply. Systemic factors that impair healing include malnutrition, immunosuppression, genetic connective tissue disorders, and metabolic disorders. This concludes Pathology Chapter 2, Lecture 2.